Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, Please join me in opening a Bible to Romans chapter 8. And if you don't have a Bible with you, there's some around underneath seats nearby, and that's on page 944. Um, I was just thinking this morning, if someone said, you can't have a Bible anymore, I'm taking yours away, and you'll never have access, but you can tear out two pages. I'm going for John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer, and Romans chapter 8. And so, just an encouragement to you through this series as well. Um, if I know some of you have been reading this chapter or studying this chapter or memorizing this chapter through this series, and some of you have been reading the text and praying in light of the text ahead of Sunday. Um, so, if you've been doing that, I hope that's been helpful for you. I know some of you have, and you've told me that it's been really encouraging. And if you haven't, I encourage you to consider doing that. A simple thing to do is just read Romans 8 straight through before the sermon every week. Um, We have a few left, uh, four or five. Uh, We also put the upcoming sermon text in our midweek email every week so you can know what's coming on Sunday and read and pray for all of us together um, in light of that. And so here we are, Romans 8, and we're seeing that in this series, sound doctrine and spiritual experience belong together. So we're calling this series Gospel Doctrine and Life in the Spirit because real Christianity is both intellectual and experiential. It's the source for systematic theology and comfort in suffering. And so these next two Sundays will actually, in an interesting way, work together to show how these two realities fit together. And so this morning, we're looking at verses 26 and 27, and then the next Sunday, we're looking at verse 28. So our text this morning is one of the most encouraging texts in the Bible on the Holy Spirit's work. And next week's text will be one of the most sweeping statements in the Bible on God's sovereignty. So this morning's text will sound more experiential. And next week's text text will sound more theological. You could say this morning's text sounds more charismatic. And next week's text will sound more Calvinistic. And both are bound together. And this is something I hadn't seen until just this week studying this text. Uh, This has been fun for me. So verse 28, which we'll look at next Sunday, I have loved and have focused on and have remembered and has been a source of great encouragement uh, for a long time. Verses 26 and 27, I have also loved, it's part of Romans 8 here, uh, but I've not focused on as much or seen the connection between verses 26 and 27, which we'll look at, and the next one we'll see next Sunday, verse 28. So, the next couple weeks we'll see how they tie together. So, let's read uh, verses 26 through 28, but we'll focus on 26 and 27 this morning. So, Romans 8 beginning in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this true and encouraging and enduring Word. So we pray now that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us understanding and comfort and encouragement and conviction, anything you need to do in our minds and hearts and lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. So can you recall a time or times in your life where you were so discouraged, so struck down that you didn't even have words to pray? Most of us can recall a time or times like that. All of us will if we live long enough. 
There will be times when you have no words, where your body just folds over, your spirit just collapses inside of you, and you can only let out a gasp or a cry or a whimper or a groan. And so here's the question, is God, is real Christianity relevant in that moment? Maybe you've heard this, when you feel so weak that you're at the end of yourself, there's still one thing you can do, and that's pray. But here's my question. And this is the one each of us will ask at some point. What about when you can't even do that? What about when you are so weak, you don't have words to pray, and if you could get words out, you wouldn't know what to say? What then? This is what Romans 8, 26 to 24 is here for. This is about the neglected comfort of the intercession of the Holy Spirit. So this text answers a question. What comfort do we have as Christians when we are so weak we don't even know what to pray? And the answer is the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness by interceding for us according to God's will. This is amazing. So this text is about the intercessory work of the Holy Spirit. There's three movements in this text we'll follow. We'll see that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit prays for us when we don't even know how, and His prayers will always be answered. So first, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Maybe you've heard it said that God helps those who help themselves. It's not true at all. This says that the Spirit helps us even when we can't help ourselves. He helps us when we are at the absolute end of our rope, when we are at the bottom of the pit, when we're at, in the darkest moments of despair in life. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, not just in our strength. This is the first part of verse 26. Do you see it here? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Not complicated. Begins with likewise, so Paul is building on what he said earlier in this chapter. So the first half of Romans 8, which if you've been with us, we've been considering for a couple months now, we're all wonder and blessing. When we trust in Christ, we are forgiven of all our sins, no condemnation, now or forever. We are set free from the enslaving, addicting power of sin. We're adopted into God's family as cherished sons and daughters irrevocably, and we have an incredible future ahead of us. But that glory and wonder to come for eternity future doesn't mean that we won't suffer now. So the pattern of the Christian life is the pattern of Jesus' life, suffering now, glory later. And so Paul turns a corner in this chapter in verse 18 to give hope in light of this reality of suffering still being a part in the midst of the wonder of salvation. And so he says, we have hope in our suffering and help in our weakness. So the hope in suffering is verses 18 through 25. We have hope because our future glory, Paul argues, is so great that it can't even be worth comparing to our sufferings now in our present pain. It outweighs it. Creation and we ourselves are groaning in this current age before Jesus returns, groaning and longing for the completion of salvation, the completion of redemption, the renewal of all things. And so we have hope in our suffering. And now in verse 26, we see, likewise, we have help in our weakness. We saw that hope sustains us in our suffering, and now we see that the Spirit sustains uh, sustains us in and helps us in our weakness. So the weakness here, what is it? Well, it's not just our physical limitations. This is our general human condition. So we have experience in life, in fallen world, and we have limitations, we have pain, we have 
suffering, and this includes those moments when we're so weak, we don't even have words, we can't do anything to fix our problem, we can't make our problem go away, we know that the rest of life will just be learning to adjust to this new reality that we wish wasn't here. That's part of our weakness. Last week we saw that our experience is marked by groaning. All of creation groaning under this sense of decay and corruption and death. We ourselves groaning as we long to have a renewed body like Jesus' resurrected body and be free from sin and sorrows. So we can only sink under the weight of grief sometimes. Pain so heavy it crushes us. We can only groan or sigh. We have no strength, can't do anything to make it better. And into those moments, the Holy Spirit comes to give His people comfort. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the comforter and the helper. On the night before He died, Jesus had promised His disciples, He was preparing for the, for the time when He was going to be gone. He's going to die, rise, ascend to heaven. What then? What next? And He said, I'm going to send the helper to be with you, the Holy Spirit. Here's how he put it in John 14. He said, I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And Jesus saw that sorrow was filling his disciples' hearts as he spoke about leaving them. And he said, it's to your advantage that I go away. An amazing statement. How could it be better that Jesus is gone? Because he said, if I don't go away then the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. So there's a trade-off, and Jesus is saying, it's preferable that I go, so I send the helper to be with you. And of course, when Jesus returns, we have the Spirit, Father, Son, together with us in the fullness forever. But now, we have the helper. And so Jesus died, he rose, He sent His Spirit, and the Spirit is the great gift of the gospel. It's God's presence with us. If you're a Christian, when you trust… I mean, Romans 8 is kind of like… I just… as I'm in this chapter, I just think most of us had no idea what we were getting into when we first started following Jesus. We're like, okay, I lived a perfect life. He died. He rose again. He ascended to heaven, and I can be forgiven of all my sins because of the cross. Awesome. I'm in. And then, really, you just walked through the the wardrobe into Narnia, and you're looking around, and Romans 8 is like, you're just kind of exploring it and saying, oh my goodness, the wonder that is true of me that I had no idea about. That's what the Christian life is. It's just learning just how massive God's wondrous kindness is to us in Christ. And one of the realities that we walk into had no idea how great it would be is the presence of the Holy Spirit as the helper and comforter. So here's what the Holy Spirit's presence means for us. It means that in the moments when you feel most alone, you are not alone. In the moment when you have the least hope, the Holy Spirit is there to give you hope. In the moment when you feel most weak and helpless, you have a helper. In the moment when you feel most overlooked, you are seen. In the moment when you feel completely misunderstood, you are understood by he whose opinion matters most. In the moment when you feel most forgotten, you are remembered. There are times also when we feel so crushed and confused that the only thing we can do is just pray and say, Lord, help. And the only, that's the only prayer we can even get out. But What about those times when you can't even say that? You're so confused, you don't even know what to do. You can only, in God's presence, sigh and groan. What then? What's the hope and encouragement then? Well, the Holy Spirit comes to help us in those moments as well. Prayer is the one thing we can do when we can't do anything else, and sometimes we can't even do that. And that's okay. The Holy Spirit is helping you, even when you are too weak to ask for help. I remember times when I felt like this. Maybe some of you have had these times come to your mind this morning when you just feel like your insides collapse. You get a phone call. Your brother died. 
your mom died. You go in and find out there's no heartbeat in the baby. And you just don't know what to say. You don't even know how to feel. You don't want to feel what you feel. And you don't know what to do. And in those moments, how is God looking at you? How does God feel toward you? Is he saying, really? You're so weak you can't even pray? Like You can't even ask me for help? You're just going to sit there? How pathetic. How, how many years have you been a Christian? And you don't know how to pray? You don't know how to trust me right now? No, he hears your groan, and the Holy Spirit groans with you and for you. He's there to help you. Have you heard that God will never give you more than you can handle? It's another lie. God, I mean, it's true if handle means like absolutely can't handle, then that's probably true. Uh, He'll give us what we absolutely can't handle. Um, He'll bring us to the absolute edge. And the edge is not where we come to the point where all we can do is pray. It's beyond that. It's to the point when we don't even have words to pray. And even there, he holds us up. And he supports us and he'll help us. Here's how Ray Ortland Jr. put it. If all you can do is lift your heart cry to God, that does not prove that you are a saint, a Christian. Just the opposite. This is God's way with the saints. It's hypocrites who always have the answers and always have something to say and think they know everything. But it is the saints who are led by the Spirit, verse 14, out into the extremities of life, where all they have left is empty hands lifted before God. All they have left is the anguish of their hearts. All they have left is nothing but need. It is helpless people like that whom the Holy Spirit helps to lay hold of God even more than they know. Such believers are not failing to live the victorious Christian life. They are, in fact, more than conquerors, even when they do not even know what to pray. They are God's saints living out his plan, not only in its glorious outcome, but even in its agonizing process. Through the suffering, unto glory. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. But how does he help us? What is he actually doing to help us? This is the second point. Answers the question, what's he doing? The Spirit prays for us when we don't even know how. This is the rest of verse 26. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So this gets specific now. So we saw our general weakness and the Spirit's general help, and now we see a specific weakness and the specific help. So the specific weakness is that we don't know what to pray for as we ought. This isn't just a general statement that we're not good at prayer, although that might be true for many of us. This is talking about those moments when we're so overwhelmed that we don't know how to pray. And look at Paul. He's including himself here with this we. Even Paul knows what it's like to not know how to pray, not even know what he ought to pray for. Of course, we know how to pray in general. We can always pray, your will be done. We can always pray, God, do what's best for your glory and my good. We can always include that in our prayer, but sometimes we don't really know what we need. We don't know what to pray for, and so that's our specific weakness. God doesn't promise that we will know His specific plans for our lives before they happen. And so here's the Spirit's specific help to match that specific need. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us, this says, with groanings too deep for words. So, He intercedes for us. To intercede is to mediate or to go between. It's connected to the idea of prayer. When we don't know how to pray or what to pray for, the Spirit Himself prays for us. He intercedes for us. But how does He intercede? He intercedes for us, Paul says, with groanings too deep for words. So, Paul just said in verse 23 that 
There's groaning going on. All of creation is groaning, and we ourselves are groaning. And now we see the Spirit is groaning as we groan. He groans with us. He turns our groans into His. And His prayers are too deep for words. They transcend articulated speech. All the groaning in this context, creation's groaning, our groaning, the Spirit's groaning, it's all groaning for the same thing. It's all groaning for what Paul calls glory to come, right? Beyond the suffering, there's a glory to come. Creation's waiting for the renewal of all things. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies, and the Spirit Himself is groaning toward that end as well with us, joining on our behalf And really, that future end for us is being conformed to Jesus' image, a resurrection body like His and character like His. And the Spirit's praying for that character to be taking shape even in our hearts now, which we'll see in the next few weeks. An incredible encouragement. So when you don't know what to pray for, yes, you can trust God's will will be done. But more than that, you can know that the Holy Spirit is with you and in you praying that God's will will be done for you. He's praying perfectly for you. The Spirit is praying that your hardship, your particular hardship, would work together for God's glory and your good. What an encouragement for Christians in some really hard situations. Christians, when they enter into a phase of getting Alzheimer's, when they start not even remembering things, not knowing how to pray, and it gets worse and worse. Christians who are in a coma, so out of it, they're not quite themselves maybe in in certain times, or other situations where you have mental illness. They're not alone. The Spirit is with someone who's not even of a sound mind anymore to pray, and the Spirit's of a sound mind, groaning, praying, interceding with them with groans too deep for words. They may not be able to pray anymore, but the Holy Spirit is praying for them and His prayers are heard. So finally, how can we have confidence that this makes a difference? It's the last point. The Spirit's intercession will always be heard. Or we could say His prayers will always be answered. This is the point of verse 27 now. We'll take a minute to think it through though. You can read it again. It says, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, Christians, according to the will of God. So the point of this statement is to give us confidence in what he just said in verse 26, to give us confidence that the Spirit's prayers are effective, that they matter. And there's two reasons that we see here that Paul gives for why we can have confidence. First, the Father knows the mind of the Spirit And so he hears the prayers of the Spirit. So the Father is the one who searches hearts, and he knows the mind of the Spirit. Now, why would that be said here? I'm pretty sure I didn't have any idea until thinking about it this past week. Um, But think, think it through. Why is this here? Because we just read that the Spirit is interceding for us. We don't know what to pray. The Spirit is praying, but he's praying in groans too deep for words. It's transcending articulated speech. How can wordless groans be heard? and answered. Well, the Father knows what that wordless groan means. He knows the mind of the Spirit. He hears the Spirit's intercessions for you. And the second reason you can be confident is because the Spirit, His intercessions are according to God's will. So, this says the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, the Spirit is not praying random prayers. He's praying according to what He knows is God's will for God's glory and your good. He knows God's will, and so he prays for that to happen for you. And this is why his prayer is certainly always answered. So now here's the connection to verse 28, which we'll look at more next week. I've never seen this connection until this last week. Verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So God works everything all things, even our most tragic moments of pain, He works everything together for the good of His people. So, if you are in Christ, every moment of your life is being worked together 
by God's sovereign rule and plan for good. Every single thing will work together for God's glory and your good. It may not seem like it at first. You may not see that good until after you die, but God's doing this. And here's the connection between what we're looking at and verse 28. Why does everything work together for good? How do we know that? Well, one of the reasons is this. Because the Spirit knows the Father's will and is praying for that to happen for us. And His prayers will be answered. I mean, look at the flow of thought. The Spirit intercedes for us according to God's will, and we know everything will work together for our good. So, When you don't know what to pray for, you don't even know what would be good for you. The Spirit knows, the Spirit prays, the Father answers. Now you could say, well, if it's going to happen anyways, why is the Spirit praying? I don't know, because this is awesome. This is personal. God doesn't just kind of mechanically unfold the universe. He's personal. He engages us. Father, Son, and Spirit participating in this plan together, inviting you to participate. So here's what this means for you. In the moments when you're most confused about God's plan, in the moments when you're most uncertain how this could possibly work together for anything that could be called good, in the moment when you don't even know how to pray, the Spirit is with you, in you, and groaning prayers for your good. He's praying for you. He's praying according to God's will that every tear that he watches fall to the ground, will saturate the ground, and up from that, something will come and blossom. Not in the next five minutes, maybe. Not in the next five years, maybe. You may never even see it happen and understand how it's working, but it'll work out for God's glory and your good. It will be beauty in the end. Sometimes you pray, Father, take this suffering away. Heal me. Heal her. But sometimes we know that maybe it's not His will. Maybe He has purposes to accomplish through it for our good and His glory. The Spirit knows God's will, and so the Spirit may pray along with you, yes, Father, take this away. Heal her. And the Father answers. Or He may say, Father, I don't know. You get the point. I'm kind of putting words in the Spirit's mouth. I have no idea how this actually sounds or comes across, but Father, she doesn't know that you have allowed this for a thousand reasons, and one of which is to keep her dependent on you. So help her right now as she's praying for you to take it away. Help her to trust you, to learn to become like Jesus and sharing in his sufferings through this and accomplish all those thousand things through this that she doesn't have a clue you're going to do. And that prayer is going to be answered. And a few days later, a few weeks later, you may say, why didn't you answer my prayer? And the Father is thinking, I answered the Spirit's prayer, which you don't realize was actually a better prayer. So, in light of all this, a few implications. First, let's learn to draw encouragement from this in everyday life. I don't think most of us go through our lives thinking about and being encouraged by the Holy Spirit's intercession for us. Many of us may not have even known it was a reality until this morning. There's no other verse in the Bible that I know of that speaks of it as explicitly as this. And this truth is not just for encouragement on Sunday mornings or this particular Sunday morning when we look at this verse, but for everyday life. How would your life be different if you could per- perceive the intercession of the Spirit? Meaning if you could be, just have a conscious awareness of this. At any given time, especially when you feel weak or discouraged, the Spirit is there. Whether you perceive it or not, He's there interceding for you. So, here's what it's like. Imagine if you're 13 years old, and you live with your brother and sister and your parents, and you and your siblings are in a season where you feel like your parents don't get you, your parents don't care about you, you don't understand their correction, Um, You don't think they're really thinking about you. You don't appreciate their advice. But then one night in this season when you're kind of grumbly about them, uh, you walk by their, your parents' bedroom, and you hear them talking, and you pause and listen, 
and you hear them talking about how to bless you the next day. You hear them talking about planning how the day is going to go, and one of them is going to go get groceries. And they say, let's make sure to get this because, you know, Sally loves this. And you hear them planning, you know, you have a birthday coming up in a, a month or so. You hear them planning and talking about ideas, about how to bless you and love you, get something that you'd enjoy. And you hear them talking about who's going to take you to school the next day and how they can use the car time to just be intentional, to encourage you, bless you, not have it be a wasted time. You hear about something that was going on in school that a teacher said, and you're wondering how to help your child. You hear, that, you hear your parents talking about how they can help you grow. And then the next morning, you go by that room again, and you hear your dad whispering. And since you're now in the habit of trying to listen and overhear, you get closer, and you hear him praying for you. Asking God to make the fruit of the Spirit happen in your life. Asking God to bring you a, a friend because he knows you've been lonely. Asking God to renew you, help you to know Jesus, help you engage, help your conscience to be working. Asking God to help even bring you and your dad closer together over time. And then the next few days, you just make it a habit of walking by their door and you hear them talking again about how to plan the next day and you hear your dad whispering prayers again and you do that for several days. Would that not change your life? Would that not change how you view your parents? Would that not change your sense of security and love and comfort in that home? You and I are going through life oftentimes so unaware of just how much God loves us. And every moment, He is plotting for our good. And we grumble about His plans because we don't know a fraction of them. And part of what he's, the Spirit's doing is praying that we would trust the Father in this hardship and know that He cares. We doubt His love. We wonder if He cares about us. And we're seeing in this text that He loves us to the core. We have a Father who will work everything together for His glory and our good as His people. We have the Lord Jesus who came to live and die and rise for us and for our good, who Himself is interceding for us, which we'll see in a few weeks, and who's more excited to come again and renew us than we are for Him to come back. And we have the Holy Spirit with us moment by moment in love, groaning with us. So you may not have a clue how your suffering is going to work together for good, but you, you know that you have the creator of the universe who made you and knows you and loves you, working it out, and you have the Holy Spirit praying when you don't even have words. So you may ask in your suffering, where is God? And the answer is, He is right there. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you. Second, let the Spirit's prayer encourage your own prayer. Many of us have a really hard time enjoying our prayer life. I'm with you. We struggle at times. We're distracted at times. It can feel rote and predictable and stale. But let this reality encourage you. When you pray, what you're doing is participating with the Spirit who's already praying. He's there with you. He's interceding. And even if the only prayer you can get up is a wordless sigh and groan, that's okay. It's not a problem for him. He welcomes your weakness, and he prays for you and with you. So pray to the Father in light of the Son's work and with the Spirit's intercession. Just knowing this reality is happening is itself a motivation to give prayer another shot and to keep going. Because it's not just you talking to some distant God who may or may not be paying attention. You have a God fixed on you and by the Spirit with you, and you're invited to participate in this reality. You don't have to know how to pray all the time. Maybe you don't know how to pray. You don't need to sound smart and amazing and spiritual. God's just looking for you to bring your whole self and pour your heart out. 
and also related to prayer, this shows that you cannot mess up your life by bad prayers. God will not answer your prayers that you may even think are good, but are not as good as they could be. Um, Sometimes we may wonder, why didn't God answer our prayers? And the answer is because He was answering the Spirit's better prayer instead. You prayed one thing, you didn't know the big picture, you didn't know what's best for you, the Spirit does, and so the Spirit's prayer overrides yours. And if you knew, and when you will find out one day, you'll say thank you for not giving me what I thought I needed and wanted, but giving me what was actually best. Third, weakness is not subpar Christianity. Weakness is reality, and so real Christianity is acknowledging that we have weakness, we have limitations, we're not as amazing as we like other people to think we are, but knowing your weakness does not disqualify you from being loved and used by God. It qualifies you. He came for the weak. The Spirit helps those who are weak. Fourth, this reality we're talking about is available for anyone and everyone who comes to the Father through Jesus. If you are not a Christian, let me ask you a question. The God that we've been talking about this morning, of singing about, praying about, and I've been talking about from the Bible here, is this the God that you thought was there? Or is the God that you've been a bit aloof from or maybe curious about um, different? I've talked with many people who think God is distant and aloof and unloving, but it's not the real God. The real God is this one. The one who loves us and draws near to us and helps us in our weakness. A God who is so powerful that He can work everything together for the good of those who love Him. And a God who's so personal that He draws near and He groans with us in our suffering. And the way to know this God is a big part of it, the first step, just acknowledging your weakness. Just coming to Him and say, Lord, I'm weak and I'm sinful. I turn from my sin and I receive Jesus and the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. And finally, Christian, don't overlook the Spirit's moment-by-moment presence in your life. Some Christians don't think about the Holy Spirit much at all, and they have a very limited understanding of the Spirit's power and work in our lives. But other Christians, and some of those who seem most excited about the Holy Spirit's work, also have a very limited view of the Holy Spirit's work. They focus on the Spirit's more outward and miraculous gifts, speaking in tongues, the gift of prophecy, giving divine guidance at certain times. Romans 8, though, shows us the quiet and yet powerful presence of the Holy Spirit in every moment of the Christian's life. He sets us free from the power of sin. He gives us a whole new mindset in life. He leads us to kill sin and love our Savior. He bears witness in our hearts that we're God's children. That's what we've been seeing through Romans 8. And now we see that He's groaning and interceding for us in our weakness. He's doing all of this at times when we don't even know He's doing it and we didn't ask Him to. Whether you're someone who focuses on the Spirit's work or neglects it, He's doing this. It's a powerful work, but it's quiet. The Holy Spirit is humble. He's often taken for granted. He doesn't actually want to be the focus of attention. One of his roles is to shine the spotlight on Jesus and say, look how wonderful he is. But acknowledging that the Spirit is doing that and honoring him and worshiping Father, Son, and Spirit is fitting. He's often taken for granted. And the good news is he's not waiting for you to pay attention to him for him to get to work in these ways. He's doing all of it anyway. anyway. So we have an opportunity then to acknowledge it and praise Him, and praise Father, Son, and Spirit for this incredible work. So, this is part of the Narnia that we walked into when we became Christians, or you are invited, if you are not a believer, to get in on this through the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for this wondrous truth. We praise You for who You are. Father, Son, and Spirit, we praise you, and we worship you together, and glorify you and honor you together for your work of creation and redemption and renewal. And Holy Spirit, we praise and honor you for this quiet and powerful work in our life, groaning, interceding for us. Father, Son, and Spirit, We pray that you would transform us by your word 
and help us to live with a happy, glad awareness of your goodness to us in every moment of life, including the hardest moments. And we pray that this would just produce in us the fruit of the Spirit and that we would live radiantly in our world and lead others to know you as well. Amen.